Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm just gonna start doing my part of the talk um, just as people are joining. Um, welcome to the Essex Seminar Series. My name is Kazi. Today I'm gonna be moderating the seminar series for us. Um, so today we have Professor Sandra Uter from North Carolina State University, who's going to talk to us about new insights on snowfall from observations of winter storms. I just wanna remind all of you here that this seminar is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel in just a couple of days. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Ralph to introduce our speaker. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kazi, and yeah, welcome, Sandra. Um, Sandra is a distinguished professor, uh, and, and as Kazi said, at North Carolina State University, the Department of Marine, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences, where she, I think, has been since around 2005. Um, got her PhD, University of Washington in 96, and uh, has done extensive work um, in satellite and in situ data, especially um, leading several field campaigns during her career. And um, I've, I've known Sandra, we, we did some similar related work um, a while back on the TRIM, TRIM science team. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to her. I uh, look forward to uh, learning more about some winter storms. So welcome, Sandra. Okay, well, thank you, Ralph, for that introduction. And let me uh, share my screen. And it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk today about uh, snow. And um, I'd like to thank uh, the members of my team, um, Matt Miller, Laura Tompkins, Luke Allen, Kevin Burris, Declan Crow, Jordan Fritz, Logan McLaren, Toby Peel, also the entire NASA Impact Science team. So I'm showing a lot of uh, impacts data today. And then a special uh, acknowledgement to Brian Colley. Um, He's also on the impact science team, but he's, I've also been collaborating with him um, on an NSF collaborative research um, that's related to winter storms as well. So before I get started, I want to just clarify some terminology I'm going to use. So I'm going to use the term snow to refer to precipitation size ice. So basically particles that are big enough to fall as distinct from cloud size ice, which would remain suspended. And then I'm going to talk about something called the age of snow or snow age. And by that, I mean the time since the particle first attained precipitation size. Another term I'm going to use is microphysical pathway. And basically, that is the changes in math, mass, both positive and negative, as the snow particle passes through different environments in the storm. All right, so I'm going to start off with where we're going to end up, which is a quite surprising finding that there's a low correlation between enhanced reflectivity and what we've been calling snow bands on regional radar and hourly surface snowfall rates. And I'm gonna give you evidence for this as well as the reasons why. The key reasons are that um, within the storm, we're usually observing mixtures of snow particle shapes and degrees of rhyming, and that's making it quite difficult to do interpretation as well as uh, remote sensing retrievals that it takes about one to two hours for the particle that usually forms near cloud top in a generating cell to reach the surface. In that time, those localized pockets of higher mass tend to get tilted and smeared. And that the um, in situ data is basically telling us that the ambient storm conditions are uh, gonna give us episodic ice growth as well as periods of sublimation rather than continuous growth through the storm. So I'm gonna use, be using a lot of data from the IMPACTS uh, field project. So that's the investigation of microphysics and precipitation for Atlantic coastal threatening snowstorms. So the science goals were all centered around trying to better understand snow bands in terms of characterizing them with different kinds of observations, understanding the different processes and microphysical pr properties with the eventual goal of improving retrievals and modeling of snowfall. So the key way that we observed with impacts was coordinated aircraft flights between the NASA ER-2 and the NASA P-3. So the ER-2 had four uh, downward pointing radars at four different frequencies, as well as passive microwave radiometers. The P-3 had a number of different instruments in situ. There's regular uh, meteorology, as well as some specialized equipment to me measure water vapor, as well as some uh, a bunch of different kinds of microphysics probes, and I'll be showing you some data from that, 
We also were able to drop sons from the P3 when we were over water. So we had three periods of field observations. We were able to get the first one in in 2020, just before COVID hit. And then we came back in winter 2022 and 2023. And we have a total of 33 intensive observation periods. And then also in addition to the aircraft, we also had some ground-based radars, some that were in fixed sites, others that were deployed to where we were planning to fly the airplanes. And we also uh, launched radio sons. So I'm gonna actually start with some data from the ground-based radars. So here is data from the CASPER radar. So this is uh, at Stony Brook University and it's a, uh, a facility that's run by Pavlos Kalias and Mariko Oni. So what I've got here is, um, let's close this off here, uh, a couple of different panels. The top panel is uh, spectral width. So that's related to um, turbulence in the air. And so the, the RHI is scanning up and over. Um, so we're gonna get less good data directly above the radar and better data on the sides. But if you look at that spectral width, you see lots of very thin features of higher turbulence and particularly higher turbulence near storm top where we have overturning circulations. In the middle, there's Doppler velocity. So that's the winds along the radar beam. Um, so if the winds are near zero, that means they're perpendicular to the beam. So when we look at this, we see that in general, we've got the winds moving from the left to the right of the page. Um, but then we also have some layers where it's uh, very close to zero. And that means that the winds are actually into or out of the page. And then right at the very bottom, actually the winds flip completely and go in the opposite direction from left to right. All right, and then lastly, the reflectivity, lots of detail here. In particular, I wanna draw your attention to the generating cells, these overturning circulations associated with the turbulence, the vertical air motions, and that's then leading to these sort of, sort of uh, ice streamers, but the ice streamers are very tilted and you'll notice that they don't have to get very far below the generating cells before things really kind of smear out. So when we look at things like this, we can, as I said, see these overturning convective, you know, we have instabilities near cloud top that's leading to a lot of production of precipitation size ice, but there's not a clear sort of vertical continuity to what happens to that ice um, in large part because of the strong horizontal wind shear associated with these winter storms, the different layers and the stuff being blown all around. All right, so sort of giving this sort of as a background about what real snowstorms look like, I wanna sort of do a little bit of review. All right, hold on a sec here. About environments for growth of snow. So this is a diagram where we've got relative humidity with respect to water on the x-axis and temperature decreasing with increasing height on the y-axis. On the right is the um, approximate height above the zero degree sea level uh, based on a standard atmosphere. So the big point to get out of this is the relationship between the relative humidity with respect to ice and the relative humidity with respect to water. You'll note that as we go to lower temperatures, higher in the atmosphere, I can get relative humidity with respect to ice of 100% at lower relative humidities with respect to water. Okay, so I'm gonna be getting ice growth in the green area. So supersaturated with respect to ice, subsaturated with respect to water, and then in the blue area where we're supersaturated with respect to both. All right, so another way we can use this diagram is to indicate where we would expect rhyming to occur. We're expecting rhyming where the relative humidity with respect to water is 100% or greater. And based on a lot of empirical data, as well as what we know about ice nuclei, et cetera, we're gonna have more higher concentrations of super cold liquid water at warmer temperatures, lower in the atmosphere. So the potential for rhyming is more at the, at the lower, closer to freezing than very high up in the atmosphere. All right, so when we think about ice growth, there's over, I don't know, 200 or more different ice shapes that have been documented in the literature, but fortunately, there's only six kinds of ice growth, and these are indicated here. Um, so it's tabular, things that produce hexagonal plates, columnar, um, branched, side branched, tabular polycrystalline, and columnar polycrystalline. So which one that forms depends on both the air temperature and the vapor content. And what, as the particles fall, they're gonna fall through different environments and so go through different um, growth forms. 
All right. An important thing about this is to note that these branched forms only occur for conditions where relative humidity of the speck of water is greater than 100%. And as we're going to see, that's not a very large volume within the storm. All right, so here's just some examples of what polycrystals look like in natural ice. So these are formed from single ice nuclei, and then they have branched, oh, sorry, not branched, multiple growth in multiple directions from that one ice nuclei. Um, and just to note, it's important to distinguish polycrystals from aggregates. This is data from the FIPS, um, which is a, a instrument from the Karlsruhe uh, people. Um, and it's really these very high definition uh, images are really allowing us to actually distinguish the difference between things like polycrystals and aggregates, where some of the older probes that are not as high resolution, it's harder to tell the difference, but these are clearly polycrystals. All right, so let's kind of fill in the details on that ice growth diagram. So I've color coded here and let's just kind of walk through it. I wanna point out that this information is not new it's based on the Bailey and Hallett work as well as others. And basically what we just did is we revisualized it to make it easier to interpret. Um, and this was something that grew out of the work where I was trying to come up with things for class because I teach this material. All right, so let's sort of go walk through it. So the ambient relative humidity, um, ambient relative humidity with respect to water being 100, over 100%, that's really only gonna happen in updrafts. The other place it can happen is very, very local. And I'm talking tiny, tiny distances from ice crystals, where as the ice crystal falls, we get slightly higher vapor pressures. So that's called ventilation. So that's another way that we can get relative humidity greater than 100%, but that's not ambient. So the ambient, we need to be in updrafts to get over 100%. Otherwise, we'd be by ventilation. All right, so let's kind of walk through things. Um, what we're expecting to see is that, you know, we're going to have periods of growth in these different environments, which means that at any given location, we can get growth, we can see crystals that grew in that environment, as well as crystals that grew in environments and then fell through. So as we get lower in the storm, right, we're going to get more of a mixture potentially of different things together. All right, so let's kind of walk through where these different things are. Oops. All right, so no ice growth less than 100%, that's easy. Side branched, a relatively small part of this diagram, actually the relative immunity with respect to water has to be greater than about 102, doesn't occur very often. Branched a little more, but again, the relative humidity with respect to water has to be greater than 100%. All right, then we've got two regions of tabular growth, one at higher and one at lower temperatures. We've got columnar growth in between them and then tabular polycrystalline, and then columnar polycrystalline above. I want to particularly draw your attention to this multiple, because this is a problem in the sense that it breaks the relationship between uh, temperature and vapor pressure and ice shape. In this region of low ice supersaturation, we can get multiple shapes co-occurring at the same time. Okay, and what we're going to find is that a lot of the storm does actually have these low supersaturations. So it's something to consider, and I'll bring it up again once as it's relevant. All right, so for those of you who prefer to see your ice growth diagram in terms of vapor pressure, here it is. Um, I just want to point out that when there is a high vapor pressure density excess, we can get rapid ice growth in a number of different shapes tabular, columnar, as well as branched and side branch growth modes. I've been advocating to retire the term dendritic growth zone because I think it's based on a misconception. We can get rapid growth, as I said, in these other shapes, tabular and columnar as well. All right, so let's take a look at some examples of sequential growth. These are um, the two in the green, they're the same crystal with two different views. The FIPS uh, takes two different pictures at the same time. So we've got tabular and then probably because of ventilation, it transitioned to branched. And then in the blue, I've got columnar and then transition to branch. And that would involve both upward motion because I've got to move the temperature, I've got to decrease the temperature as well as increase the supersaturation. So maybe a little bit of an updraft, maybe a little bit of ventilation as well. Here's another example of sequential growth. 
we get very complicated 3D particles. Again, two views of the same particle. This initially started as columnar polycrystalline. Then we had some tabular growth and then some branch growth. Okay, so for those of you who do radiative transfer modeling, this is probably a nightmare particle for you. Um, as I said, very complicated um, structures. All right, so a little more review, rhyming. Um, often see different degrees of rhyming. We've got unrhymed up in the upper left, a nice column. We've got a lightly rhymed branched. Um, then we've got a moderately rhymed. If you look closely, it's tabular growth followed by branch growth. And then grapple, basically when we call something grapple, it's we can't tell what the original crystal was. Um, so these are data from the FIPS. And then I also wanted to show you what it looks like from the multi-angle snowflake camera, which is an instrument that we had uh, hosted at Stony Brook for multiple years. So most grapple is actually pretty small. I've got a dime here for uh, reference. Um, and as I said, you can't tell what the original crystal was. It's just so rhymed and that's the definition. But as I said, in winter storms, most of the grapple is quite small. All right, so the last bit of review, aggregation. So I talked about polycrystals. This is what an aggregate looks like. This is a particularly large one. So it's a collection of particles that form separately that jumble together. And you notice that there's a lot of you know, variation. If you look closely, you can see some more columnar crystals. There's some more uh, tabular. There's even some indications maybe of some branched. There's also different degrees of rhyming. And this thing is all kind of loosely held together. Um, we won't see big aggregates with the aircraft data because this kind of structure would be, you know, just, you know, kind of there's enough turbulence associated with the probe that it would break it up. But we can see it with the surface instrumentation like the multi-angle snowflake camera. All right. So one of the key things that we want to think about when we interpret microphysics is that microphysics is a time integrated state. All right. It's everything that happened to the particle prior to the observation. And in ice, we actually get a picture of that sometimes if we, you know, um, depending on the image. So in this case, I've got an image of an ice particle started with vapor deposition, some branch growth, then we got sublimation. I can tell that it's been sublimated because the edges are rounded. And then I've got rhyming on top. So it's impossible for these three things to happen in the same place at the same time. You obviously can't get vapor deposition and sublimation at the same time. So when we interpret the data, what we want to be thinking about is that we found the particle at that location, but not that it formed there, okay? Or certainly it didn't all form there. So as I said, we have this complicated particle. It has a time integrated state, all right? Another way that it's time integrated is the set of particles that end up in the same volume. We very commonly see particles that clearly form separately that get mixed together. We can see that with the FIPS data, um, different shapes, different degrees of rhyming. And then we can also see it in aggregates that we see it come to see at the surface, because in order for them to aggregate together, they had to have been in the same place at the same time at one point during their path. And again, you can see a wide variety of shapes, degrees of rhyming all mixed up together. Um, the one kind of aggregate that we do sometimes see where there's not as much mixing is ones that are just made of columns or needles. We did see that um, a bunch of times at Stony Brook, but most of the time I would say we had these sort of more mixed aggregates, but occasionally we would just get aggregates that were more just composed of needles. Just another example here, more just particles of different shapes and degrees of rhyming often occur in the same volume. That snowflake on the right, this was an aggregate that then consisted of rhyme particles and then it passed through the columnar area and collected a bunch of columns that are unrhymed. So we see very complicated mixtures of things. More information about mixtures. This is data from the FIPS that uh, my student Logan McLaren looked at minute by minute. So the different colors are different growth forms. The different gray scales are different degrees of rhyming. The takeaway message here is there's lots of mixtures. <laughs> um, in a given minute's worth of data along the flight leg. This particular flight leg is near cloud top. Um, and one of the flight legs where the P3 aircraft was closely coordinated with the ear too. All right. So another thing we wanna keep in mind as we do our interpretation is that snow falls slowly. Okay. About one meter per second, plus or minus half a meter per second. So 
add that up, it takes over an hour to fall four kilometers. A lot of snowstorms are like eight kilometers tall, so it's almost two hours. A lot can happen in an hour. This talk's going to be less than an hour. Um, so just think about that in terms of the fair amount of time we have for integrated properties to accumulate. I also want to note a little um, a feature we're starting to use in our data, these aspect ratio indicators here. When we plot data, we often stretch the aspect ratio. This one is a three to one. So the bottom shows what a one to one aspect ratio is. And then the top shows what that 45 degrees at three to one is. So even though this stuff is tilted in this image, it's actually even more tilted if you were to plot it on a one to one ratio. All right. So what I'd like to do is just take a moment to kind of think through what a time integrated property is and what that means in terms of our interpretation of it. So I'm going to suggest that chess is a good analogy to microphysics in some ways. And if we look at a chessboard for a game in progress, it has a time integrated state, right? It, it's the result of multiple moves. So is it a good analogy? Let's take a look. All right. So for chess, there's a small set of rules for moving the pieces. For microphysics, there's a small set of rules for changing the mass. In chess, the next move is dependent on the current configuration of the board. Microphysics, the next change in mass is dependent on the current environment within the volume. Okay, in chess, individual pieces have different numbers of moves to get to their current positions. And I would say for microphysics, individual particles take different paths to get to their position and together and their current mass. And then the other thing is that the board contains multiple pieces with different properties, right? Different, uh, you know, knights versus kings versus pawns. And in the microphysics, we have resolution volume contains multiple particles with different properties. All right, so with chess, we can actually calculate the number of configurations and people have done that and that's here. All right, so after each player has played one move, there are 400 possible configurations. But as we add moves, they very, very rapidly increase. So two moves by each player, four moves total, we're up to 72, over 72,000. By the time we get to four moves by each player, we're over 288 billion. Okay, so it's a very simple system with a very simple set of rules that has a time integrated state, but this is what it means to have a time integrated state. And I think what this means for us with microphysics is that within a few tens of minutes of snow age, that we have an enormous number of paths to get to the observed microphysical state. And I would argue it is so many that it is unwieldy to unravel it based on the information that we have in the current observed state. And most of the time we just have information, we just have a snapshot, whether it's from a radar or an aircraft going through or whatever. So we're, we just have the current observed state. How can we, you know, it's, we don't really have enough information to unravel everything that happened to those particles. All right. Another thing we wanna be thinking about is the mismatch in time scales. Okay, between the kinematics and the microphysical state. So as we've discussed, the microphysics time integrated for an hour or more. Kinematics, very different. They're going to respond very fast to changes in pressure gradients and buoyancy. Okay, and usually they're not steady state. The one exception would be like orographic forcing, which is more steady state. But in most storms, the kinematics are not steady state. Here's an example just from a 2D squall line. This is uh, from my colleague, Matt Parker here at NC State. You can see just the bubbliness of the upward motions and the mixing ratio of precipitation as well as the potential temperatures. This is not a steady state storm. We saw that the storm that I showed you at the beginning from the RHIs was not steady state. There was a lot of variation. Here's another example. This is a Colorado winter storm. Again, we're seeing lots of small scale variations in spectral width and variations in the radial velocity, and then also changes in the reflectivity. This is not steady state, okay? So when we make our interpretation, we've got this time mass match that we've got to deal with. All right, so sort of distilling the results, we commonly see evidence of cloud top instability, 
generating cells, yielding precipitation size ice. Just a little note here, the P3 and the ER2 were so well coordinated that we would occasionally see the P3 actually show up in the radar data uh, of the ER2, and that's here. Okay, so we've got these cloud top generating cells. They're yielding precipitation size ice. Associated, this is the uh, vertical air motions. We see some overturning circulations here. Okay, but when we look below cloud top, we see that things get are getting tilted and smeared. All right, and we got to be again mindful of the mismatch in time. If I sort of just sort of ballpark it and say, okay, at the top of you know the top of the storm, I'm going to say it's zero. By the time we get mid levels, it's 33 minutes down toward the bottom, it's an hour or more. This snapshot, if I'm gonna make an interpretation, is probably pretty good right near cloud top where the age of snow is short. So this is like representative of the velocity conditions in which this sort of band of layer of stuff form. But as I get lower, there's gonna be more and more of a mismatch. So this, the microphysics here toward the bottom part are not representative or are not a product, sorry, of this vertical velocity field. This winter storm, let's say maybe the snapshot of velocity from the ER2 is good for about 10 to 15 minutes. All right, another thing, winter storms, lots of horizontal wind uh, shear, no surprise. Um, here we've got the ER2 data and then overlay down that are the horizontal winds. We've got summaries of those wind characteristics here um, in terms of the speed. So they're starting off at like 30 meters per second up near cloud top and then dropping down to about two meters per second and then picking up again a little bit toward the surface. Hold on one second, I'll take a sip. This is a representation here <clears throat> of the wind direction changes and you can see the wind directions moving around. In fact, in these two examples, near storm top, the wind directions are nearly perpendicular to the direction that the ER2 is flying which is indicated by these arrows. And so pretty much those generating cells are generating ice and then that ice getting immediately blown out of the page. Um, so it does make the interpretation more difficult. So when we do some back of the envelope calculations based on the, the speed of the wind, typically I would say by the time we go from cloud top to near the surface, the ice particles are moved about 50 kilometers or more in the horizontal from that origin generating cell location. All right, so let's look at more data. This time we're going to look at in situ vertical air motions. So start up here on the upper left, we've got the horizontal distance along the track, and then the vertical air motions are in the reddish color. The particle concentrations are the blue, so we're in cloud when we have particle concentrations. Um, and you can see the variations in the vertical air motions. And then I've got two depictions, which kind of combine data from all, this is actually all the data from uh, 2020 and 2023, sorry, 2022. The distributions of vertical air motions, most of the vertical air motions are weak. This other project plows was run by Bob, Ra excuse me, Bob Rauber in the Midwest, similar distribution, very weak. Um, not a lot of strong motions, either up or down. The other thing we can do with this is we can look at the envelopes of the updrafts um, and see that most of the updrafts are small. So just defining the updraft at about 1.1 meter per second, the vast majority of them are less than two kilometers. So they're just very small. They're not broad at all. Um, only less than about 10% of the air has even updraft velocities that are capable of lofting precipitation size ice. All right, so more about the environment and cloud. Here, what we've done is taken distributions of relative humidity with respect to ice, um, and then just sort of group them into fewer cloud particles, moderate number of cloud particles, and many cloud particles. So the big takeaway, most of the volumes that we observe with the airplane, where we had particles, the relative humidity with respect to ice was less than 100%, okay? Um, that multiple ice growth mode is here between about 100 and 105% relative humidity. It's only when we get in situations where we have a lot of cloud particles, do we actually even see some of these higher relative humidities with respect to ice. Okay, so the vast majority of the storm volume is actually subsaturated with respect to ice. I would just wanna note there is some uncertainty about these data. We're um, 
going to soon get the data from the laser hygrometer, which was installed on the P3 just for the 2023 data. Um, and that's going to actually help clarify these exact numbers. Um, but I do have independent data that corroborates um, this. All right. And that's from soundings. Um, my PhD student, Kevin Burroughs, looked at vertical structures from our soundings. And he also traced the next red radar data along the sounding trajectory. So that's what's here. Okay, so a couple of things to note, right? Here's relative immunity with, uh, with respect to ice in the blue with 100%, so relatively low values. Um, and then in particular, just to note that sometimes we can get precipitation size ice falling through a dry layer. So this does show up as radar echo, but if you were in an airplane, you would basically see things that look like Virga. Um, so this is an indication that radar echo does not always indicate cloud. So we have the precipitation size ice, but probably no cloud size particles. Um, so this is one particular example from Albany. Let's look at a bunch more. So he looked at quite a number of years. There are about 200, and, sorry, 522 where we had temperatures at the surface less than zero and precipitation within uh, one hour before to two hours after. So basically within storm conditions. The takeaway here, these are just sorted by cloud top height for convenience. There's lots of pinks where it's very super saturated with respect to ice and then lots of light greens as well. So just saying we've got a lot of ice super subsaturated conditions within the storm extent. All right. So now let's go back and talk a little more about reflectivity. So an important thing to note about reflectivity in snow is that we can change the reflectivity without changing the mass per unit volume. Okay, so here's all the different microphysics processes. The middle column is whether we're changing ice water content or liquid water content, and then whether what kind of change it does to reflectivity. So I particularly wanna point your attention to aggregation and melting, right, aggregation, it's going to increase the reflectivity because reflectivity is related to the size of the particle, um, including those jumbles, and also will increase with melting related to the dielectric constant. Okay. So just to give you an idea, just to remind you, here's some more aggregates. And I also wanted to show you some partially melted particles. So from the radar's perspective, it sees these as large particles with a dielectric constant of water. All right. So just to kind of contrast between rain and snow. So for rain, we actually have it pretty good. So we know what the density of water is and it's constant. We have a very well defined mass to shape relationship. We know that small raindrops are round or spherical and the bigger ones are more like hamburger buns. Um, and then if we can assume an exponential like particle size distribution, we have a pretty good relationship between the mass per unit volume uh, the backscatter and related to the shape, you know, size and number. All right. With snow, we've got issues. The density varies depending on the degree of rhyming and the irrigation. The shapes vary uh, depending on the microphysical pathway. And the mass per unit volume is going to vary based on all those things. It's different shapes, rhyming, and aggregation properties. So on the right here, I've got some really cool data from Troy Zarimba. He just had a paper that was published in Jamsey. So this is from the Snowy Project in Idaho. And what they've got is where they've carefully matched the ice water content from the Nezirov probe with the reflectivity from the Wyoming cloud radar. Okay, so this is, I think, one of the best data sets I've seen, which really, you know, is actually looking at the, you know, reflectivity versus ice water content together. And the big takeaway messages are that for a given reflectivity, there's quite a range, like an order of magnitude, even at 10 dBZ for ice water content. And for a given ice water content, there's quite a range of reflectivity. So there's just a lot more uncertainty. The kinds of things that we can do with retrievals of rain, we have way more uncertainty for snow. All right, so let's now look back, look at some more impacts data. So what we've done here is carefully matched. And this is work that uh, Laura Tompkins has done, carefully matched um, the reflectivities from the uh, ER2. And you can see the line where the plane is in time with the path of the plane over the regional radar data. Okay, and there's four different frequencies and they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. 
um, with the cloud rotor being the most sensitive and this one better at handling uh, larger particles. But when you look at this, there's nothing that immediately, I would argue, jumps out at you as something you would necessarily call a snow band. There's not a lot of vertical continuity or back to this whole, we've got some variability at cloud top, and then we've got some tilted and smeared structure. All right, I'm going to actually go back and go through the things that on the regional radar look like snow bands. This first one here, eh, I, it's not, I mean, there's stuff, obviously, and the little X is the value that we're using for the composite. It's going to depend on uh, the location of the nearest radar, and if there's two overlapping radars, we use the highest one. And then over here, again, there's some stuff, but again, there's no vertical column, like the kind of thing that we would see in um, warm season convective line. Okay, so we look at this and we go, yeah, okay, I see the snow bands in the regional radar, but if I just was given the cross section from the ear too, I think you'd probably be hard pressed to say there was a snow band in there. All right, here's some radiometer data. So radiometers are uh, vertically integrated. Um, these are high frequencies, so it's ice scattering. Um, so this is the same band we were looking at in the previous slide. I've got, uh, this is Matt Miller's work. We've got two uh, crosses here corresponding to that. These crosses in the close-ups, and this is where the band is nominally. Okay, and for ice scattering, we're expecting a decrease in the brightness temperature, so bluer colors. I think you might argue you see a bit of something here in the 89, but in the other channels, I think there's not much. So what this is saying is, again, there's sort of a lack of vertical continuity in the enhanced ice mass. True, these ER2 are not perfectly uh, vertical. They're somewhat at an angle, but again, this is evidence of things being tilted and smeared. Um, we're not really seeing a clear signature in the in the ice in the in the radiometer data either. All right. So when we look at winter storm mesoscale bands, I would say they're very unlike warm season convective lines. Um, some of the longer bands, especially associated with strong phonogenesis, this is work that um, originated actually with the David Novak's paper. Um, but if you look at the details of these mesoscale bands, I would say they appear more like transient features. They're definitely not static things that are moving with the flow. If you look closely, you can actually see bands moving in different directions at the same time. Um, and actually some kind of go through other ones. So then you start to wondering, what is this really? So first off is how do we define them? And I would argue that it, we're better off defining them as local enhancements rather than at a fixed threshold, all right? So in terms of these bands, Sarah Gennettis, which was, uh, she was a uh, Brian Colley student, did an analysis and looked at the phonogenesis in the regions of different kinds of banding. And so the big takeaway was that there is some strong phonogenesis. There's a tendency for that to be associated with the bigger, longer bands. Um, but we also get plenty of bands, and this is just the, the vertical extent is the phonogenesis here. Um, we get plenty of bands where we have very weak phonogenesis or even frontalysis. So some are clearly associated with phonogenesis, but a lot are not. All right. So with all this, we actually began to question to what degree are these bands actually having an impact on surface snowfall? We've been assuming that they do, but the data is basically suggesting that, uh, Need to be thoughtful about this. All right, so what did we do? So we carefully looked at this hourly surface ASOS data. Okay, so we took the stations in the Northeast US, 25 kilometers of radius around them, and then we're only gonna use the most high quality subset of the data. Okay, so that criteria is, it has to have snowed for at least four hours. The wind speed has to be low. The reason for this is as good as our gauges are, they, they have problems in higher winds, particularly with blowing snow. So we're going to discount those. We don't want them, you know, messing up our data set. And we're only going to use the stations with the weighing gauges that have the windshields for the best data. So here's an example. So we've got some trace here, and then we're going to, the ones with the lines, that's the data we're going to use. These are measurements from the gauge, but we're not going to use them because the wind speeds were too high. All right. 
So that's the ASOS data. Then we're going to look at the NEXRAD regional maps. All right, the first thing, as I mentioned, we don't want to count anything that's melting. So uh, in Tompkins et al, we described this uh, technique where we use the rho HV, which tells us where the melting is. And then this idea of image muting, these are grayed out. So these are the grayed out areas where there's melting. So that way we're not going to count them as enhanced reflectivity features in snow. And then the way the algorithm works is that we rescale the data to snow rate to make the snow bands a little, or to make the linear features a little more easy to see. And then um, we're going to use an, a, a dual adaptive threshold. There's two thresholds that are adaptive to the background and then classify the field into a background reflectivity, uh, stronger, more distinct features and faint features. Okay. And uh, Loris processed this for from 1996 to 2023 and it's all available on Dryad. All right, so now we're gonna combine the ASOS with the radar data. So what we're gonna do is again, match in time, look at this attribute, which we call area time fraction. Okay, so a fraction of a half could be obtained by if we have 100% coverage in the vicinity of the ASOS gauge for 30 minutes or 50% coverage for an hour or various other variations like 75% coverage for 40 minutes. Okay, and then as I said, we're only going to use the most reliable um, portion of the ASOS data where we've got the lower winds. Okay, and then we're going to match, as I said, the area time fraction of faint and strong features as opposed to the background versus the ASOS. All right, so here's where that big surprising finding comes from. Most of the time, the locally enhanced reflectivity is associated with low snow rates. All right. If there was a relationship between area, time fraction, and snow rate, we would expect something vaguely along a diagonal like this, but we don't see anything, okay? And yes, there are some points up here where we've got high feature area and high snow rates, but they represent a very tiny proportion of the sample. So each of these samples is one hour. So it's quite a large data set from uh, 2012 to 2023, all right? So let's kind of walk through this. So first off, high feature area, heavy snowfall, it does happen, but it's less, it's about 1.5% of the samples. So if you were now casting based on radar reflectivity, I think it would be a bad bet to say that it's likely to be heavy snow because it only occurs a tiny fraction of the time. So on the bottom here, I've got in red where these uh, two crosses are, we're approaching the second one over here where we have high feature area and uh, stronger snow rates. All right, so let's move on to another part of the diagram. High feature area, low to moderate snow rates. So you see the feature passing over the ASOS and the snow rates. And then again, the crosses correspond to this period indicated in red low feature area and low to moderate snowfall. This is the vast majority of the time. It doesn't snow very hard. And then low feature area, high snowfall. Think, you know, there's definitely some features in here, but they're not lasting very long. So low time area fraction, but we're getting some high rain rates, sorry, high snow rates. In fact, some of the highest snow rates in the sample are associated with this quadrant. All right, so we've looked at this a number of different ways. I've showed you the data for zero hour lag. If we go to one hour lag, it doesn't change things very much, nor two. We've also looked at it with different sizes of the area around the ASOS and it doesn't change the results. All right, so back to our big picture takeaways. All right, low correlation between enhanced reflectivity and snow bands and hourly surface snowfall rates. So this is a big surprise. We organized the impacts projects to understand snow bands, but then it turns out that don't really seem to have much of an influence on surface snowfall rates, what we're seeing in the reflectivity. Why, why is that? Well, there's a couple of three big reasons I would argue. One is that, that Retrieval is much more complicated than we thought because we've got these mixtures of shapes and degrees of rhyming in the same volume. 
okay? Associated with that, why we get the mixtures is we've got one to two hours for that snow to fall from near cloud top to the surface. In that time, the ice streamers are tilted and smeared. We end up with a situation where we don't have vertical column continuity between the enhancements in the radar observed Z of the passive microwave brightness temperatures and the surface snowfall. And I would argue, even with a few steps in terms of those microphysical pathways, we just don't have enough info to unravel the time integrated properties. All right. And then lastly, the ambient conditions imply that ice growth is episodic. A lot of the storm volume appears to be not, uh, is, is subsaturated with respect to ice. We do have updrafts, but they tend to be small and localized. And what that means is most of the storm volume has the snow basically just falling through horizontal wind shear layers rather than growing. All right, so what is what is the sort of the implications? So I've got a couple of thoughts about this. I would suggest that in regions without distinct upward forcing, whether it's storm frontogenesis or orographic lifting, that we probably should refrain from calling enhanced linear features and reflectivity in winter storms snow bands. Okay, so this holds for observed reflectivity, all right? We want to be a little careful, though, because I think there's a thing that could confuse people, and that is conflating forecast model predictions that are displayed as reflectivity with observed reflectivity. So in a forecast model, it calculates ice water content. Sometimes for display, it is converted to radar reflectivity. That conversion is pretty simple. It just uses a rain, uh, sorry, a snow to reflectivity relationship. That relationship does have a one-to-one -one relationship between increasing snowfall rate and increasing reflectivity. Okay, and I've got an example of that with the HRF where the output was converted to reflectivity. So in the forecast model, enhanced reflectivity, if it's displayed, is associated with higher ice water content, but that's not necessarily true for observed. All right, so what's another ramification of this? If we're gonna evaluate forecast model output, I think what this means is we can't use the observed radar data because of this sort of lack of relationship between snow mass and the reflectivity. So as painful as it is, because it's more not as, you know, it's not a gridded data set, I think we're better off evaluating model predictions of snowfall with the hourly surface snowfall equivalent in the non-blizzard conditions, i.e. the low wind speeds, rather than using retrievals in radar data. Okay, so I'll leave it there and I'll take any questions. Andrea, so anyone with questions, go ahead and raise your hand. You should be able to unmute yourself. Or if you don't have a mic, you can type it in the chat and I'll read out loud. So Sandy, a lot of the times with uh, either ground-based observations or even space-based observations, like from CloudSat, we're just doing the reflectivity to the snowfall relationship. It, it, this kind of makes you wonder, you know, how well those types of retrievals will do. But I, I, I guess I'm wondering what, type of additional information would you need to make those sort of retrievals better? Is, is there anything else that we could collect that helps to better define those, you know, better relate to surface snowfall? Well, I think, okay, I think we could constrain the problem with an instrument we don't quite have. So we have instruments that get us like pictures of snowflakes and and in fact the FIPS image also gets some backscatter, but what we really need is a uh, particle by particle mass. Um so I think we could maybe sort of constrain the uncertainty, but I think based on our current remote sensing, I don't see a clear way out of resolving the very large uncertainties associated with the fact that we've got these mixtures of shapes and degrees of rhyming. Do we have any other questions? You can raise your hand or just unmute yourself.
Nehan, I've seen you. I, I see that you've unmuted, but I can't hear you. I don't know if that is intentional. If you have a question, you can go ahead and type it. Type it out. I don't know. If, I don't know if you're trying to ask one. We can't hear you. Cassie, this is Ralph. I, I had a question um, for Sandra. I can't seem to get my camera uh, to work right now. So Sandra, I know I know the focus was East Coast, uh, this recent experiments, but I know you did a lot of work on the West Coast. You, did you see similar results um, or would you expect similar results on the West, West Coast of the U.S. Um, as you see here? Um, well, we don't. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I did some... Um, yeah, we, we don't have this sort of same kind of market physics data. Okay. Um, but I think I I would expect it to be similar. I, I wouldn't necessarily expect snowstorms um yeah, in the in the West to 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 not have mixtures because you still have the same basic issues in that you have the particles falling through different growth modes. Mm -hmm. Um so you know, like I think some of the retrievals essentially assume that given a given temperature and and, and uh, relative humidity that that's the shape you're going to get. But but the problem with that is, in some sense, that assumes something kind of crazy, which is as as you move to different temperatures and relative humidities, the the shapes you know like a tabular crystal would morph into a column, which obviously won't happen. Um, so I think you know, particularly when you get lower in the storm. I think the mixtures are inevitable. I think there is a fair amount of rhyming. Um, I think that's pretty common. I think just looking at the data from plows, granted that was Midwest, the structure of the upward motions, again, very small updrafts, relatively weak. I think all that's very similar between the East Coast and the West. Okay, great, thanks. Nehan um, wrote what they were going to say in the chat, um, and they said, I just want to point out that surface snowfall rate only increases when the snow bands move along its long axis, which is shown as 1.5% in your data. Well, so no, because uh, basically we're just looking at the area time threshold. So it could be that the band is, it could move any number of ways, or there could be multiple bands in that hour. So what we did, I think, is a little more general. Um, yes, there's definitely been case studies where people look at bands that are sort of pivoting, in which case the band is over an area for a, you know, a longer time. And I'm not saying it never happens, okay? I'm just saying it happens rarely. So that particularly from a now casting perspective, it's not a good bet. There was another question in the chat um, that was regarding, I think it was Scott's question, um, that says, will dual pole radar help better identify slash correlate with snowfall rate? I think the particular, well, it sort of depends on what frequency, but particularly at S-band, there's not a lot of help um, because of the sort of nature of the quality of the data. Um, Again, you know, with with the dual pole and there's like a dual pole frequency ratio can give us some information about size, but it's not helping us resolve the fact that we've got mixtures. So if you make an assumption about that, I'm going to have only a single shape and a size distribution of that shape. Right. That's what a lot of retrievals are based on now. But but what I'm saying is that assumption is a poor assumption because of these mixtures of shapes and degrees of rhyming. And so the dual pole isn't really able to help us with that. Okay. Oh, there's another comment from Mehan. So ZS relationship probably can only be done with the reflectivity that mostly close to the ground not really the reflectivity from generating cells or even the higher elevation reflectivity from next rad. Right, and, and I think all I'm just saying here is when people convert from um, the model 
ice water contents, they use a simple ZS relationship. That's all I'm saying here. I guess actually, technically it's right, a snow to Z relationship. So, so yeah, there's an issue, right, with this retrieval of the observed, but let's put that aside. We're saying there's a lot of uncertainty there. I'm just saying when model output is displayed, okay, and it's converted to a reflectivity field, that code does not take into account aggregation. And so it's a relatively simple relationship. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions before we wrap up today? Or comments? Okay, well, um, thank you so much everybody for coming and thank you to Dr. Sandra Uter for giving us this great talk today. Um, we are continuing our seminar series for one more week next Monday. So please join us for our last seminar of the semester um, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. Pleasure to have you. Take care.